Peugeot has high aspirations for its 508 medium range model, which means that it needs to offer cutting edge electrified technology and does in this plug-in hybrid form. There's a price to pay for the convenience of limited fuel-free mileage, but you'll gain some of the outlay back in lower taxation payments and petrol savings. Fastback and SW Estate variants both feature with this setup, and there's premium packaging and appealing design to sugar the asking figures. Stricter emissions regulations have forced every brand to invest in electrified engine tech. And it's been interesting to see how different manufacturers have prioritized the different technology options the industry currently has to offer. The French PSA Group, which owns the Peugeot, Citroën, DS and Vauxhall brands, has chosen to ignore the two self-charging options, mild and full hybrids, and instead install full EV powertrains in its smaller models and plug in hybrid engines in its larger ones, cars like this Peugeot 508 hybrid. The same setup is offered in the Lion Brands 3008 mid-sized SUV, but with the 508, it can't be had in 300 horsepower all-wheel drive form. With the 508 hybrid, the idea is to address a primarily business-orientated clientele attracted by the low taxation opportunity that models of this kind offer. People currently considering cars in this class like the Volkswagen Passat GTE, the Skoda Superb IV and the BMW 330e. This, in theory, is the fastest 508 variant you could choose. Uh, this hybrid model's combined 225 horsepower system output is matched by the top version of the conventional 1.6 litre PureTech petrol turbo model, but this electrified variant, not surprisingly, produces more pulling power, 360 newton meters of it. That goes on to be blunted, though, by the fact that the hybrid tech adds a portly 280 kilograms to the curb weight. This actually isn't the first time we've seen a hybrid 508 model. Uh, the first generation design was available in electrified form too, but that was a self-charging setup mated to a diesel engine. This time round, a 180 horsepower, 1.6 litre turbo petrol power plant combined with an eight speed auto gearbox is mated to a 110 horsepower electric motor on the front axle powered by an 11.8 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery. When fully charged, this allows for 32 miles of WLTP rated all electric driving range. You get four driving modes, with the ones you'll be using most of the time being the hybrid and comfort settings that choose the best mix of electric and petrol propulsion to suit the driving style whilst optimizing efficiency, the latter softening the standard adaptive damping. The alternative settings are either Sport, where the car combines the power of the electric and petrol motors to offer livelier performance, and Electric, uh, battery power only, in which guys the car is apparently able to run at up to 84 miles an hour. With the engine chiming in, 62 miles an hour from rest occupies 8.3 seconds, and the top speed is limited to 155 miles an hour. The hybrid system's extra weight slightly blunts the handling, but refinement is exemplary, even with the PureTech engine working, and the ride is superb. Now, unless you happen to be a Peugeot dealer or an ardent fan of the brand, you're unlikely to be able to tell a 508 hybrid apart from a conventional variant at a glance. There's a special dichroic version of the Peugeot Lion brand logo, some additional hybrid badges stuck on the rear wings, an extra left-hand filler cap for voltage charging, and a cyan light that shines from the interior mirror when the car is in all-electric motion. If the 508 formula appeals, you don't have to have this body shape. There's an alternative SW Estate version that looks equally avant-garde. Either way, there's a clear desire here from the designers to do something different, which we really like. As advertised, the roofline really is quite coupe-like, 
uh, low and sleek, barely reaching 1.4 metres in height and flowing into intricately fashioned rear wings that require a complex metal curvature stamping process, normally only used on exotic sports cars. This is one of the things that's made possible these super thin premium style shut lines. Further forward, the key upper crease lines separate beneath the door mirror, this pronounced one defining the waistline and a gentler angled sweep flowing back beneath the door handles. Giving the flanks further shape is this lower crease line just above the door sills, which separates arches housing large wheels that can be anything between 17 and 18 inches in size, depending on trim. We've got 18 inch uh, Speroni diamond cut two-tone rims fitted here. It may well be though that it's the sharky looks of this front end that'll really sell this car to you. In which case you might want to be aware that two of the things that most notably characterize it aren't available with the cheapest Allure trim level. That's why you'll probably want to stretch at least to either GT line or this top GT spec, both of which deliver the two features in question. This chrome plated checkerboard style grille and these really really quite distinctive slim LED tusks that flow from the headlights right down into the spoiler. The horizontal bonnet has been lowered as far as the designer's dead and in a nod to the brand's classic 504 model of the 70s, these days bears a model designation for the first time since that period. We also like the rear treatment with its elegantly raked back tailgate and rear lights that sit behind stylized glass panels. The ultimate visual effect possible here is also trim specific. Only top models like this one get full LED 3D rear illumination with a pronounced claw effect signature that springs into life as part of a welcome sequence when you unlock the car. The lamps feature adaptive intensity, different appearance depending on your pavement perspective, and as usual with modern Peugeot designs, are separated by a glossy black horizontal strip. Of course, as ever, what's more important is the stuff you can't see. In this case, a sophisticated EMP2 platform that's enabled this second generation 508 model to shed 70 kilograms of weight. As for the inside, well, it'd be disappointing if the extrovert exterior styling wasn't mirrored by equally interesting treatment of the cabin. And that's just what you get. Here you get a very different design to the kind of thing you'd normally expect to find in this segment with a standard of fit and finish that justifies Peugeot's premium pretensions. The hybrid model changes are subtle in this very high quality cabin. There's a little lightning bolt piano key button just below the center dash infotainment screen, which accesses various hybrid specific functions. There's an extra energy display option for the instrument binnacle screen. We'll get to that. And the auto gearbox lever gains an extra B option so that regenerative braking force can be altered. That's about it. As ever with a 508, the interior feels of much higher quality than you'd expect from a volume brand, aided in sophistication by a digital instrument binnacle screen and a huge display for the aforementioned central monitor. As usual with a modern Peugeot, there's an eye cockpit dash layout you'll have to get used to that leaves you looking over the smaller steering wheel at the instrument binnacle rather than um, conventionally through it. Now that wheel is small and low set, facilitating a wrist flick quality of steering feel that Peugeot reckons uh, its owners really like. It features a uh, flattened top and bottom section so that when you adjust the thing, it's easier to find a position that doesn't either brush your knees or obscure the gauges ahead. A few writers still complain that they can't see the digital dials unless they position the wheel lower than feels natural, but none of our testers have experienced that problem. A word about those instrument gauges. They represent another of this cabin's defining talking points. Conventional dials completely replaced by this fully configurable and customizable 12.3 inch color screen. We mentioned earlier its extra energy display option, which shows a power meter with power, eco and charge sections to help you drive more economically. 
That power meter turns sideways on the right hand side of a second driving screen layout option and there are four other screen layout options available. Personal, minimum, dials and navigation all accessed via a roller switch on the left hand side of the steering wheel. This prompts intricately animated changes from the state of the art animation and gives visual priority to speed readouts, navigation mapping or driving safety features. Or you can choose to view only the absolute minimum of information if all of that gives you a headache. With the personal option, you can decide what the two main virtual dials will show. Uh, power meter, driving aids, engine info, g-force meter, temperature, media, navigation, or trip computer information. Everything else you'll need to know can be found on what looks like a tablet PC attached to the fascia, a multi-function color touchscreen that's 10 inches in size. This works well, though is sometimes a little slow to respond to requests. It can, like the instrument layout, display in your choice of two colours, blue or copper, as it deals with the usual stereo, phone, navigational and informational functions. It also has a mirror screen feature that via the Mirrorlink or Apple CarPlay systems allows the monitor to show certain apps from compatible smartphones. Uh, we were less pleased to find this screen also burdened with the ventilation controls. In our view, key things like that are much better separated out. Still, on the plus side, the menus on this display are easier to access than they are in some other PSA group models, uh, because these beautifully crafted piano-style keys just below the monitor offer instant shortcut options to the monitor's most commonly used functions. The right hand one is the lightning bolt key that we mentioned earlier. Time to take a look at what's been served up in the rear, which requires a slight duck around the sloping roof line on this fastback model. Because this design was created from the outset to accommodate battery power, there's no compromise in rear seat accommodation with this hybrid variant, and a couple of adults will be quite comfortable. Leg space is actually much better than a premium brand D-segment model of a similar sort. There's uh, three centimeters more legroom than you get in a comparable Audi A5 Sportback, for example. Now, of course, all of this is relative. You'd get considerably more space from something more mundane, like hybrid versions of the Ford Mondeo or Skoda Superb in this segment. Despite the swept back roof line, head space won't be at too much of a premium unless you're a basketball playing stature. The relative narrowness of the cabin won't help if you have to take three folk back here, but the low transmission tunnel makes dealing with that eventuality easier than it would be in some rivals. There are seat back pockets, you get twin central vents, beautifully illuminated lower USB ports, and decently sized door bins, plus this center armrest with twin cup holders. The optional panoramic roof doesn't stretch back uh, to illuminate things back here, but otherwise it's a very high quality feel. And it'll all feel particularly nice if you have a top variant with these intricately stitched seats. Unlike most other PHEVs, boot space is unaltered over the equivalent combustion engine model, which in this case means that you get 487 litres of capacity in the hatch and 530 litres in the SW estate. There's a 12 volt, a bag hook, uh, tie down points and also a helpful compartment beneath the boot floor where you can store the charging cables, though you do lose the convenience of a spare wheel. If you need to take longer items, you'll be pleased to find a ski hatch provided. And if you flatten the rear bench, up to 1,537 litres of capacity can be freed up, or up to 1,780 litres in the SW Estate version. You'll need to be prepared to pay quite a premium if you want plug-in hybrid capability for your 508. Prices start at around £35,000 for the Allure variant and extend through mid-range GT line trim up to just over £40,000 for this top GT. 
That's for the five-door hatchback body style that Peugeot wants us to call a fastback coupe. The alternative SW Estate, likely to account for around 60% of the model mix, commands a £1,600 premium over its showroom stablemate. To save you doing the sums, that means the hybrid kit adds between £4,250 and £3,625 onto the price of a conventional 1.6-litre PureTech 225 petrol model. The kind of money Peugeot's asking here puts this car up against premium badged, similarly sized rivals like the Mercedes C300e and BMW's 330e. So to offset the volume branding, equipment levels need to be generous. As is obvious from the prices we've just given, the value lies further down the range. Base Allure spec gives you all the kit you could reasonably want. That includes diamond cut 17 inch alloy wheels, keyless entry, a color reversing camera, ambient lighting, power folding door mirrors, all round parking sensors, part faux leather upholstery, and active suspension that works through the settings of the drive mode system. Plus there's connected 3D navigation for the center dash touchscreen that also includes Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, smartphone mirroring, and the usual audio, Bluetooth, and voice recognition features. Mid-range GT line trim adds front fog lamps, full LED self-leveling headlights, a wireless charging mat and sportier styling. And with this top GT spec you get Nappa leather upholstery, a surround view camera system, massaging front seats and a Focal premium hi-fi setup. Here we've got two desirable options, the panoramic opening glass roof and a night vision feature which uses infrared vision to highlight hazards at night. On to safety. As you'd expect, there are all the usual things, uh, twin front, side and curtain airbags, though no driver's knee bag, uh, Isofix child seat fastenings, tyre under inflation detection and an active bonnet that would minimise injuries in a collision with a pedestrian. Plus there's the usual electronic assistance for braking, traction and stability control. And across the range you get Peugeot's Connect SOS and Assistance package that will automatically alert the emergency services with your exact location if the airbags go off. In addition, you'll want to know about the cutting edge electronic radar driven stuff and there's plenty of it. As you'd expect, all versions of this Peugeot get autonomous braking, the brand's AEBS automatic emergency braking system that detects hazards ahead and will apply the brakes if the driver doesn't react. There's also a distance alert system that tells you if you're getting too close to the vehicle ahead and active lane keeping assistance with road edge detection, a package that will detect if you stray over the center delineating lines on the highway or over the road edge line and add subtle steering assistance to ease you back to where you ought to be. Avoid entry level trim and you also get four further camera driven features. Active blind spot detection which will alert you if on the move you're about to dangerously pull out in front of another vehicle. Advanced driver attention alert which monitors your reactions for drowsiness. Traffic sign recognition which pictures speed limit signs you pass and displays them on the dash. And smart beam assistance will automatically dip your headlights for you at night. If you want to go further, you'll need one of the optional driver assist packs uh, standard on this top GT, which include ACC adaptive cruise control. This includes lane positioning assist and a stop and go function that recognizes an oncoming tailback and can, if necessary, slow you right down to a stop, then seamlessly start you off again. Let's get to the efficiency figures. We've covered the 32 mile WLTP rated all electric driving range. It's actually more like around 25 miles in real world use. And we also ought to apply real world thinking to projections of likely fuel economy because the Fantasyland official combined WLTP figures up to 235.5 miles to the gallon for the fastback hatch clearly aren't likely to be replicated by the average owner. As a feather foot, we suppose 80 to 90 miles to the gallon might theoretically be possible, but your realistic average is going to be much less than that, and certainly less than you get from the equivalent diesel model. 
rely on the petrol engine alone and you'd struggle to average 35 miles to the gallon. WLTP emissions are rated at up to 29 grams per kilometre for the hatch and 30 grams per kilometre for the SW. These figures will mean attractively low benefit in kind figures. At the time of this test in summer 2020, for a 508 hybrid with a lure trim, a user in the 40% tax bracket would be paying £1,395 a year. To give you some perspective, if the same user were running a 508 with a 1.5 litre Blue HDI diesel engine, the annual taxation fee would be £2,415. Compared to, say, a conventional petrol 1.5 litre Ford Mondeo, this car would approximately halve a typical business user's annual benefit in kind taxation exposure. Talking of taxation, uh, you'd have to think pretty hard before choosing this top GT version because this variant's list price of over £40,000 means that a user would be paying a much higher annual VED bill, uh, £455 from year two until year six. Bear in mind that you'll need to find £300 extra to upgrade your 508 hybrid to a model incorporating a 7 kilowatt hour monophase onboard charger that would be capable of accepting charge from anything faster than a domestic 3-pin socket. This halves charging time when charging with a typical garage 7 kilowatt wall box and it really ought to be standard. Charging the 11.8 kilowatt hour battery takes three hours and 45 minutes with a standard mode three type two cable or two hours if the optional onboard charger has been fitted. You can use a provided smartphone app to set low tariff charging times. Uh, Peugeot is offering by six months free use of the Polar public charging network, but you won't be able to use the fastest rapid chargers. Peugeot has to produce cars like this 508 hybrid. It doesn't necessarily have to sell a lot of them. Most of the brand's profit comes from small cars and LCVs. If models like the 508 can also sell, then so much the better. But they can't drag down the brand's across the range collective CO2 performance in the way that would these days deliver eye-wateringly high EU fines. So plug-in tech needs to be offered in this 508 model, even if high pricing means that the market for it is still quite small. But we can see why you might want one, especially if you're seeking a stylish business conveyance and the current market trend for various flavours of SUV has passed you by. The taxation arguments are difficult to argue with and the attraction of mostly fuel-free commuting mileage is considerable. As with a 3008 hybrid, we think that you need to stick with base allure trim for the financials to really make sense. And in this case, we'd opt for the practicality of the alternative SW estate body style. With those caveats in place and a competitive finance deal on the table, this car starts to make some sort of sense. But if you don't agree, Peugeot won't worry too much. Sell a V.